So back again with my co-conspirator over here, Mel, uh, there in Ireland, and I'm here in the United States, thousands of miles apart, right next to each other, almost can shake hands. Uh, and we're, we're continuing with these series of investigations. I guess that's the best way. Looking at etymological uh, investigation, looking at textual criticism. These are going back and trying to find out where this title, this word, this name, Muhammad comes from. Obviously, everybody that's watching, and whenever we say the word Muhammad, you immediately, uh, you immediately go to the man, uh, the prophet of Islam, because that's all you've been told. That's all you've been, or are forced to use. And Muslims would want you to make sure that that Muhammad, the one, their prophet, is the one that uh, that has that name, and uniquely so. It's as if they want us to believe that that name never existed prior to him actually being named it. But here's the problem. That name has a history. That name has antecedents. We've looked at that already in the previous episodes. Uh, we've noticed that it's in uh, chapter 68 of Psalm. Uh, it's also in Song of Psalm in chapter 5. Uh, we've noticed that he uh, Karl Heinz Oleg, the German scholar, has actually traced this word all the way back to Yuga from 1400 BC. Uh, that's where it was originated. And it has the same meaning then that it has now. It hasn't changed. It's always meant the praised one, the desired one, the lovely one. All these references to someone who is engendered, who is really someone that is attractive or something that is attractive. And yet, so now, the claim has been that this could only be a man, not necessarily very attractive or lovely, but a man who is the model for Islam. What we're going to do now, and this is one that we've always asked, Mel, haven't we said, listen, if you're going to make claims, uh, historical claims, then for heaven's sakes, How's it in history? Because the only historical claims that Muslims can make about Muhammad, the name, is the man, coming from 9th and 10th and 11th century sources. So we're going to say, and we've always said this, if you're going to make these claims about this man, then go back to the 7th century, for heaven's sakes, and see where this name existed in the 7th century. So that's what we're going to do, and you're going to do it. And I'm going to hand it over to you because this is one of my this is going to be one of my favorite episodes because it's dealing with coins and inscriptions from the seventh century. See, the great thing about coins and inscriptions is they don't disintegrate, they don't deteriorate, they're made out of metal, they're made out of stone, they're chiseled out of stone, and they're also they're they are minted on uh in, in, in copper or silver or gold. Because they don't disintegrate, because they don't deteriorate, they're as good today as the day they were minted or the day they were chiseled. So I'm going to ask you to go through this, these inscriptions. They are windows into the seventh century, and if we don't speak, the stones and the and the and the inscriptions and the coins will speak for us. So let them speak. And what are they going to tell us about this name, Muhammad? Excellent. Um, so we're we're really interested. Who is Mahmoud referring to? In each of these cases that we're going to look at so i'm just going to share my slides to get started right so instances where Mahmed was used on coins and inscriptions now um the first one that we're going to look at is a very fascinating one it's from the sixth century 523 a.d it's actually a jewish inscription um and obviously because it's jewish it's not going to be referring to well Muhammad, well, for, for two reasons, apart from it being Jewish, the other reason being that it's in the 6th century. This is 100 years before the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Okay, so this is a dedication still commemorating the conquest of the Christian city of Najran by the Jewish king Yusuf of Emir. This contains praises to their God for their victory. And it's in Sabaic. Now, what is Sabaic? Sabaic is a language that was used way down in Yemen. It's got a completely different script to the Arabic script that we're all familiar with, the one that was developed up in the north. And uh, you can see that down in the corner, um, there is a Sabaic word, which is Mahmed. Okay. And it is actually referring to God. It's not even referring to a man. It's actually, it's being used as um, a term for God. So the uh, the Sabaic there is given there in the, the top section. I won't even try to uh, pronounce that, but in English, it would be translated as by the Lord of Jews, by the highly praised. So who is the Lord of the Jews? That is God. 
Um, and God is being referred to there as highly praised. So God here is Mahmed, or Mahmed is God. It seems likely that Christians then borrowed the, this phrase for God, the highly praised Mahmed, and used it for Jesus, God, in the seventh century. Um, and that's where we're going to go to next. But before we do so, uh, Jay, do you want to respond to this bit here? Yeah, I just want to just remind people what we're talking about here. Now, remember, Sabaic Arabic, as Mel just said, is that Arabic that is used down in the south. It's used in Yemen, in Oman today. But that's the Arabic that would have been used in Mecca and Medina, in the Hejaz, the central part of Arabia, the deserted part of Arabia. It's not the Arabic that's in the Quran. That's what's fascinating. Remember, the Arabic that's in the Quran is Nabataean Aramaic. Nabataean Aramaic is from Jordan, which is 600 miles further north. The Quran has, and the way to know that, and Al-Jalad comes out with this, uh, Mark, Dr. Mark Dury refers to this in his book. What they say is this, when you look at the Arabic in the Quran, you will see that there are endings that are unique to the uh, to Nabataean Aramaic. Ending uh, such as the Tar Marbuta or the Aleph Maksura, those endings are only found in the Quran. They're only found in Nabataean Aramaic. Sabaic doesn't have those endings. The definite article, Al, that is not in Sabaic, yet that's all through the Quran, but that is Nabataean Aramaic. So the Quran itself, which is fascinating, uses an Arabic script that is from 600 miles further north, yet this word Muhammad here is found in the Sabaic Arabic, which is from the south. In fact, if you go and do a, a comparison, we're talking about about 1,200 miles away. And if it would have been used, in, if these people, if this is what the word that is used here in the Sabaic Arabic, this is the same word, this is the same script that would have been used in, if there was a prophet named Muhammad, interestingly, that prophet or that name is way down south. <laughs> it's down in what Yemen today. Yeah, and um, another little aside is the fact that had they used that script, they would have had an awful lot less problems in terms of the ambiguity of the Quran because this alphabet was able to carry all the sounds of the language, whereas um, in order to distinguish different letters in Arabic, they needed the dots, and of course there's problems with the placing the dots consistently in the right places, and that's one of the reasons why you have so many variants in the Quran today, it's a pity they didn't use this the script. Which is yeah. ironic, isn't it, Mel? Because it is that that is destroying the Quran in its preservation historically. Because had they used this script in if they since they lived in Mecca and Medina, this is the script they would have used. We would not have had any problem with it. There would be no Kiraat argument. There would be no Ahruf. Uh, Hatun Tash yeah. would not have destroyed the Quran in 2016. <laughs> but they used the script from where very, very much further north that did not give them a delineation of what letters they were looking at. So it, coming and going, yeah. looks like historically speaking, if you just put the script in its context, you will see. This is the script they should have used. This is the name they should have used. Again, they would have just borrowed this name from a previous revelation in this case it's highly praised referring to god himself yeah so uh just to further that if their story was true that this this uh quran was written and produced in in mecca they wouldn't have had all of those problems if only it had happened the way they said it it had happened they wouldn't have had the problems but we see the consequences it's clearly was written way up north that's why they have these uh problems with their script now Okay, so let's think about Mahmed in the seventh century. This is an example of a coin where you see Mahmed underneath the big M there. But you also notice that there are crosses on the coin. In fact, there's at least two crosses that I can see there on, on that coin. Just real quickly. So for people who don't know what we're doing, this is the front and back of coins, okay? It's not two separate coins. The left side is the yeah. front side of the coin. You have an image there and they can look on the right side, he's holding a cross. On the back side was that M, which is denomination means 40. That's how much it was worth. And at the bottom, can you see there that below the M is the MHMD? They're going from right to left. Yep, absolutely. I think a lot of people often see the M and assume it, it's that's what's referring to Muhammad. It isn't. It's it's the, the amount of money involved. Um, so Mahmed here actually refers to Jesus, the praised or desired one. 
These coins reflect a Christian rather than a Muslim milieu still in the 7th century. Now, this is from 686, 687 AD. So this is 50 years after uh, Muhammad's time, supposed time. And yet we still have crosses on the coins in relation with Ma uh, Mahmud. The problem is that according to Islamic tradition that, uh, you know, Muhammad was all about breaking the cross. Right. He wasn't in favor of the cross. You know, he, he, he wanted it broken, you know, and yes, we have coins here with the cross. That's that is a major problem. Um, I've often scratched my head and wondered why, why um, are there crosses on coins with Mahmud? Um, it doesn't make sense if you accept the standard Islamic narrative that it's ref in reference to an Arabian prophet. Um, here's another example one. This is uh, courtesy of Odin La Fontaine. We can see again very clearly there are lots of different crosses which Mahmud referred to. This is even later. This is sometime from 679 to 691. We even have a coin here where there's a reference to Christianity through the symbol of the fish. And we can see Mahmed underneath. OK, and this is uh, from uh, uh, Bet Shehan in Israel. So what we're seeing there is that Mahmed is being used in relation to Jesus. Mahmed is, is a synonym for Jesus. It's, it's a messianic title. Um, and it isn't to do with the Arabian prophet. Why would Muslims put crosses on a coin that refer to an Arabian prophet who, whose teachings said that uh, the cross needed to be uh, destroyed? Um, I'll go back to you, Jay. No, I mean, these are exciting what you're saying. Not only are the coins. Yeah, these are exciting what you're saying. Not only are the coins uh and the inscriptions very clearly these are christian inscriptions these are christian coins because of the fact that the cross is there cross would only be the symbol of christianity no muslim would have the cross and that's the narrative the islamic narrative is very clear that the cross, the cross is, a, is did not exist there was no well, jesus did not die on the cross chapter 4 verse 157 is very clear that jesus didn't die on the cross so this would be an antithe antithetical to a muslim holding the cross as a symbol yeah. of his religion and holding the cross not only yeah. once but also on the back of the coin the, the same thing and then then having the word muhammad yeah. at the bottom obviously that muhammad we've said it before this is another example of jesus Interesting, uh, the dates that you're putting on this. I had always thought these dates were earlier, that these were 663, 664. You're saying, and uh, Odin LaFontaine is putting these dates all the way back to 691. 691, yeah. that's when the Marwanids came into power. This is at the, um, you're talking at the time of the Dome of the Rock. You're talking the time that Abdul Malik was in power. He came to power in 685. So you're saying that they were still using crosses. They were still using the reference to Muhammad as late as the time of Abdul Malik, which shuts and pushes back this whole idea and suggests to me, therefore, that Abdul Malik was a Christian as well. But he was not a he was not a Trinitarian Christian. He was an anti-Trinitarian. For so people who don't realize the last slide that you put there with the fish, maybe many people probably don't know that the fish is the symbol of Christianity. It was the the symbol that they use in the catacombs to so it was a secret symbol yeah. so that they would not expose themselves. Because if they had used the cross then that would expose them uh, for, to persecution. So they would use the fish as their symbol of, uh, so they could to, to communicate and also know where there were other Christians. So it's fascinating that it's on that coin with Muhammad below that. It's the first time I've seen that coin. Thank you so much. And thanks yeah. to, to those Murad and the others who have helped you and uh, uh, Odon Lafontaine. We, if you think, Back to that recent event where a footballer from Brazil went to Saudi oh. Arabia wearing a cross, and you think about the reaction to that, you now have to imagine that at the height of Islam, at the very beginning, everyone was comfortable with coins with crosses on. It that doesn't make sense to me. So I think Muslims really have to think about: does that make sense? And I would argue it doesn't make sense if you accept. The standard Islamic narrative. I think you have to uh, think about well, maybe 
Mahmed here is actually really referring to Jesus. It makes more sense than to imagine it refers to a prophet who doesn't even believe in the cross. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. Neymar, the, the Brazilian footballer who back on August the 18th was bought for $330 million uh, by this, this football club in Riyadh, flown into Riyadh on August the 18th. Everybody was there to celebrate him because he is considered one of the best players in the world. This was a real coup for them. He walks off the plane, opens up his jacket, and there's this beautiful diamond-studded cross. That caused huge furore all over the Muslim world. Enormous amount of anger. How dare you have that symbol of Christianity? And you can see uh, it caused so much anger. I mean, I put it, we did a video on it back about a month ago uh, on Fander Films, uh, Robert Spencer and I, and I, I'm looking, and it's over 130,000 people uh, have looked at it. Just that video unpacking this cross. If it was, if that made that much anger here today in the modern world, look and see what that would have done back in the seventh century when Islam, according to according to what the Islamic sources tell us, was just being birthed. And if you're being birthed, even more so, you do not you do not uh, acquiesce your symbols, and you do not borrow other symbols, and you don't put them on coins for heaven's sakes, because coins are what create your identity you every ruler every caliph would mint coins to create his identity to say who he was to tell the whole world because they didn't have radio they didn't have television they didn't have internet like we have today they use coins knowing that the coins would be in the hands of everybody what better way to announce who you are and to announce what you belong to and who you represented which would be your religious identity that's you always give your religious identity. So that's why holding a cross or having a fish uh, to represent as a Christian and then putting the word Muhammad, that's hugely significant. Obviously, this is not Muhammad, the, the prophet. But remember, look at the dates. If we're saying that this is 680s or 679 or 680s or 690, this is, this is 60, 50 to 60 years after Muhammad supposedly died. This is when... The Umayyad Caliphate was coming to its, its, its greatest power, the strongest power. And every Muslim tells you that the Umayyad, the Umayyads were Muslims. They were all Muslims. Mu'ayya was a Muslim. Marwan was a Muslim. Uh, Abdul Malik was a Muslim. Yet these coins are from their period. And they're holding crosses. And they have the word Muhammad there, proving that in the 7th century, this Muhammad was a Christian. More than likely, as you're saying, Jesus Christ, the praised one. Absolutely. I think the, the, the point that I should add to, to all of that is that we're not assuming necessarily that these are Orthodox Christians. These could easily be heretical Christians, but the key thing is it's pointing to Jesus and not to the Arabian prophet. Okay, excellent. Now, uh, in the next episode, you're going to carry on with the 7th century, and you're going to actually looking at a Marianite uh, chronicle to show that this is well known, that this word is well known for someone not muhammad not the prophet but for jesus himself yeah when we, when we look at muawiyah's role we can see actually lots of characteristics that suggest he he himself was a christian and not a muslim yep. and this of course reinforces the idea that actually the purpose behind the crosses with Mac, with mahmed was it was all about jesus all about that's coming for up in the next episode know, for those of you who don't know who muawiyah is he is the first caliph according to, and according to the islamic tradition he's well known in the islamic traditions uh he is the one that uh dis destroys or kills uh ali the the fourth caliph there at the battle of Sifin in 661 and then takes over islam and becomes the first caliph of the umayyad caliphate living in damascus that's always a big problem for muslims to try to explain if he's taking over islam why is he not down in medina where all the other ones were what's he doing suddenly on a good 1200 miles way up north in damascus of all places well that we're going to show that he wasn't he wasn't down there because there wasn't any down there there was no Me uh, mecca at that early and of course if he is up in damascus that suggests very clearly uh that he was right there in the that the most christian of all places and you're going to show that that this muawiyah who ruled from 661 to 680 for 20 years all through the islamic narratives but he also has coins and he also has inscriptions lots of material referring to him we can't find anything on abu Bakr, umar uthman or ali those four but we can find on muawiyah this is going to be exciting folks stay tuned come with us this is jay and mel where i'm packing this name muhammad the two of us, thousands of miles apart, 
over and out. (music) 